Welcome to the Finding Purpose Livecast, where we feature authors, leaders, and speakers of purpose on a live platform to have truly authentic conversations. And now your host, Davin Salvano. Hey, Jason, how you doing? I'm doing great, Davin. Thanks for having me. Uh, I am excited for you to be here. You have such a tremendous story that I know so many organizations and leaders are going to learn from today. Today, we're here with Jason Lipper. He's the CEO of Lipper Components. And what an amazing story. We're talking about what was a family-initiated business that when he took the helm as CEO, was around $60, $70 million company that grew to almost a $3 billion company today, publicly traded with 11,000 employees. Did I get that right, Jason? Yeah, pretty darn close. Good job. Good Uh memory. So let's back up though, because I'm interested in, in, in people getting to know you, what you're passionate about, your story. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, who Jason is, and maybe your journey to the role of leading your family's company. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, married with four, four young kids. Um, I started with a company right out of college. Um, it's a family run business like you had mentioned. Uh, it was 60 or 70 million or so in the mid 90s when I when I came to the business. I started welding, uh, which was uh, hard to stomach at first because none of my friends out of college were going anywhere to weld. Uh, they were going to you know sit in nice offices in Chicago and work for Anderson Consulting or Cincinnati to Procter and Gamble. So hey, that was a, that was hard to stomach. But you know I'm so glad my dad had me do all that because uh, I welded for two years and really got to know the business from the ground up. I got really comfortable with the business and the products and I, I wouldn't trade that for the world. So uh, I, I spent a couple of years on the ground floor of the business, ran a couple really small business units and it was uh, out in Pennsylvania, uh, started tinkering around with RVs, which our company wasn't involved with. Um, took what I learned on the manufactured housing side of the business, which was 100% of what we did in the, the mid 90s and prior um, to, um, to uh, you know, just building an RV uh, supply empire, um, kind of we're all things, to, uh, all businesses on the OEM side. Uh, we've developed a lot of other businesses kind of that are adjacent to that, supply some of the same parts to different industries. So I, I don't really like talking about myself. It's hard, hard for me to do so. You know, I'll tell you that we grew the business with my team from, you know, 80 million in 90, 97 or 98 when we became public. Uh, to almost three billion today, with eleven thousand team members, like you had mentioned, and we're in several different industries. <clears throat> like I mentioned, we're probably fifty percent RV. Our, our marine business is a good ten percent of our business, so components for boats. Um, we have a great aftermarket business for marine and RV, which is another ten or so percent, and then we supply, you know, similar components to trains, to buses, to cargo trailers and equestrian trailers, and all sorts of things you can pull or tow behind a car. So that's kind of our business in a nutshell. That is a really good summary. And I think a lot of times, first of all, what you just described is, is kind of the American dream, right? Family company grew to a 60, 70, $80 million business, then became a public company, grew to a $3 billion business in all different types of industries with 11,000 employees. But what captures me about your story, which is really we're gonna spend a lot of our time today, is you were able to do all of that without really losing sight of the importance of people and culture. And you are you personally are really passionate about people, about leadership, about culture. Tell me about that. Yeah, so, you know, the culture's like any company. It's been a journey for us. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't even know what culture was until probably, you know, 2011 or 2012 you know it was uh one of those things where we just had an epiphany of you know we, we looked at our uh we looked at our, uh, our our turnover and we saw that it was really high across the industries we play in uh, and i had somebody come and talk to me and say hey look you know from outside the company say this seems really high and you know we, we looked at it and you know we said yeah there's there's uh you know why is it so high um and you know, it, it came to with a lot of. Uh, I told you the other day, a lot of prayer. I, you know, we it, after by 2010, I, had, you know, 16 years in the business, and you know, we were 20% growth year over year. 
stock price is going up every year, hiring more people, employing more families, I mean, doing all these great things, but like asking God, like what, you know, what is it? Uh, what, there's gotta be more, there's gotta be more purpose. It doesn't feel like there's purpose. It just feels like lots of winning and success and all that stuff's great. But you know, at the end of our days, I, I you know, I want to remember, uh, you know, impact, not, uh, not numbers. So, uh, so it was a lot of all these things combined. Uh, but, but the answer to, to those prayers were, uh, you know, this person that we hired from the outside that said, Hey, look, you know, don't you think, you know, uh, why, why do you think people are turning over to over a hundred percent every year? Well, for us today, that's 11,000 people, new hires we'd have to bring in every year. So once he put it in that perspective, it kind of changed our thing. He said, okay, well, why are people leaving? Let's just not call it normal. Let's figure out why they're leaving. And like most other companies that get intentional enough to figure out why people are leaving, they find out that it's leadership. They find out that it's lack of attention to the team members, that they're not listening uh, so there's a lot of things that, that set us on the journey. Um, but, you know, it was about 2012 when we finally woke up and said, we've got to do something about creating a leadership model, model and a culture model that make people want to stay here for life. Uh, and then from there, we did, we've done a ton of things and we can kind of get into that. But we've done, you know, in a journey, you're going to start taking steps. And for us, it's just been the first obvious step was just, you know, let's, let's listen to our team members. Mm -hmm. So we conducted listening sessions all over the company with our very frontline team members, the men and women that are making products for this company at the front lines. And we just asked them what, you know, what aren't we doing right? Uh, and we got all sorts of answers from, you know, our bathrooms and our break rooms are dirty. Our bathrooms and our break rooms aren't big enough uh, to the, there's, there's some terrible leadership running around that aren't doing the right things and aren't treating people right. And that's why we're leaving. It was a whole host of things. And we started listening and making changes and slowly uh, we got our, our, our team member base to trust us that, Hey, we listened. We said we were going to do some things. We did those things. And they said, okay, we'll trust them a little bit more. And we've been taking that journey for almost eight years. now. Well, I applaud you on starting with listening because that is something we can all do a lot more of, especially as leaders. I was listening yesterday to, I was tuned into an HR conference that would have normally been in person. And one of my friends who was speaking at the conference, Dr. Lee Meadows, said this statement. He said, you know, at some point, the economy is going to bring people back to work, but it's going to take more than a paycheck to keep them there. That's right. That statement was so profound to me because, you know, in the past, prior generations, uh, baby boomers, Generation X, which is my generation, you know, we, we went to school or we went to work for a paycheck and for the perks. Right. The next generation has said, you know, it, that's really not enough. When we talk about millennials, Generation Z, they're looking for a sense of purpose in their work and they're looking for a sense of partnership in terms of who their companies are helping them become. And it starts with listening. Why are you here? Why did you choose to work here? How can we help you fulfill your purpose? And who is it that you want to become so that you stay with us for your career? But there's not a lot of companies that step back to listen to those type of, of things. So I, I would love to hear and get into what are some of those things beyond a paycheck as you've taken further steps on that journey that you guys have done there to foster this incredible culture that people want to be a part of? Yeah. So I'll start with some real simple ones. We, you know, like I said a second ago, one of the first things our, our team members were, were crying out for was better leadership. So we had like a lot of companies, just a, a, a lot of leaders that were getting by. Maybe they got in the position because they were, there every day, they were fast at what they did, they were good at what they did, but that doesn't qualify them to be a great leader of people. So, you know, we realized really quickly that whether it's me, my executive staff, our general managers that run the 90 divisions that we have across the globe, uh, nobody's got enough time to mentor each individual leader. And we've got 900 in the company that lead on the front lines and up. Um, that the 8,000 men and women that are on the front lines of the business actually making product, we've got 900 of those people and they're not going to learn leadership the way we want them to learn leadership and what we want them to learn about leadership unless we have some way to intentionally teach them uh, what leadership is and train them and coach them and mentor them. So uh, we did what most companies should do and we hired leadership coaches. 
We hired pastors. We hired uh, athletic coaches. We hired a whole host of people that are good at coaching people up and that are good at leadership and understand leadership. Uh, and most importantly, understand consistent leadership. And we started bringing those people in the company one by one till we have, you know, 10 leadership coaches and their sole job is to take frontline leaders in this business. Um, the men and women who have never been coached. Some of them went to college, some of them didn't. I went to college. I never got any leadership coaching. I mean, I can go take a seminar or something like that, but, um, you know, we have them, we, we felt it important enough of a part of this problem to put leadership coaches on staff day in and day out. So they're, you know, they're, they're, they're salaried, they're, they're running around the company taking care of that leadership coaching and mentoring, and it has helped tremendously. Um, people, it's just a light bulb for most people. Oh, I was doing this and that's not good. This is what you need to do. It's, you know, it's the difference between being a manager and a boss and a supervisor. Nobody wants to be bossed around. Nobody wants to be su supervised and babysat, but that's kind of, you know, that supervisor mentality. We want leaders, you know, those pictures of leaders different than managers. You know, that's what we're going for. That's what we're trying to teach people. And it's really as simple as getting that light bulb to go off. Um, and then finding out who wants to be in leadership. We've, like I said a second ago, we've paid people up to take promotions, but 90% of the time they were doing it because the pay was more, right? Uh, that doesn't qualify them to be an awesome leader. So, you know, we got to have both. We want to, you know, pay the price, but we want leadership qualities. We want somebody to lead consistently. So that's what those leadership um, coaches really do for us. And it's been transformational. And every business leader I talk to, I try to urge to say, hey, look, it's just, just hire one. You'll see the, you'll, you'll find the benefit. Um, especially with, with larger companies that have uh, lots of men and women on the front lines of a manufacturing type business. So um, and that's where we started. You know, that's kind of what one of the things came out of the listening sessions. I go do listening sessions uh, weekly with our, our business units. So it's one of the commitments I made. If I want my people to listen, I got to, you know, I got to lead by example and, and do the same thing. So I go to the front lines and get, you know, 40 to 60 uh, frontline leaders uh, around our different business units. And I just, I, I kind of cast vision for 25 minutes and talk about what the next step, step of our culture journey is. And then I spend an hour just listening to feedback and what we can do better and what's working and what's not. And, and the best part is hearing some of the transformational stories and the impact on the purpose that you talked about that, you know, I don't think it's just generation X and beyond. I think, you know, God created us all uh, to have purpose and meaning and impact. And all we're doing as a business is trying to connect you know, those team members to find how they do that for 40, 50 hours a week. And that's the beauty of business. We keep talking around here about business being a force for good. Um, we have this 40 to 50 hours a week of opportunity to steer and align these people with good positive impact and purpose. And all we got to do is be intentional about it. We can do all sorts of great stuff. So those are a couple of things we've, we've done. Just a couple. That a couple. right there, that, is what good looks like and you're right purpose isn't defined to just the next generation i think <clears throat> you're all yeah. created god created us all with a sense of purpose and meaning the problem is is that we were externally programming from our youth to say hey go to school get a great education right find a company find a career right. solid living save money retire do all these things we chase this journey of success but we were internally wired for significance. Yeah. We were That's internally right. wired for meaning. We were internally wired for impact, to make a difference. And so I've talked about the book Halftime before and the shift from <laughs> moving from chasing uh, success to living a life of significance. And That's it's right. no mistake that you have experienced the growth that you have, tremendous growth, as an organization, because if you're not growing your people, you're not growing your company. That's and right. What you have done was a commitment to grow people through having leadership in place as a part coaches, as a part of your staff, to grow and develop others, to bring out their potential, to bring out their individual sense of purpose, so that they, they can contribute their gifts, their talents, and abilities at all different levels of your organization. And that's translated into robust good health in your that's right that's right i uh you know you, you just made me think of of 20 different things but um you know that's probably one of the greatest things today our people have myself included is we had this 
with a successful company that was winning day in and day out, but now we have this this other missing piece of, you know, now you can have significance and purpose and impact at work greater than, you know, you ever dreamed or ever had at any other company. And that's what a lot of people have to compare it to is, you know, my experience at another company. And they come here and get this experience and they're like blown away. And what I hear more often than not is, I'm gonna retire here. This is my company, uh, I'm gonna retire here. I'm never gonna leave, you're gonna have to carry me out of here because they're feeling that, that impact and significance and purpose that they never had, that missing piece that they never had with any other company they worked at. So, you know, we've done a, a lot of other things. One of the next steps after leadership, so we, we started sitting down and coaching men and women on leadership around the company. Uh, are men and women that lead two to 10 to 20 people in the manufacturing areas of our business. And, you know, the leadership coaches started coming back as I was having, you know, weekly meetings with them. And they're like, you know, man, you know, coaching this person over here. And, um, you know, they're, they're dealing with uh, a really terrible divorce. I was dealing with this person over here and they're dealing with a, uh, a, a death in the family or a sickness in the family. Um, this person's dealing with financial problems. This person's dealing with, smoking or addiction or drugs or something like that. But what we found after we started really pulling people off the line, started coaching them in leadership and getting them, you know, getting vulnerable with them and helping them through this process, you know, we learned a lot of things that were affecting their ability to perform at work that had nothing to do with work. So <clears throat> we had the idea to start hiring personal development coaches. So again, we started with one, had wild success with that, where we sat down and said, look, let's not talk about work. Let's talk about how you're doing as a, you know, as a human being, uh, your family unit, we start doing, we did dreams, we do dream sessions in that whole, um, you know, um, th those walks with those people and just say, look, what are your dreams in life? What are your dreams for your family? What are your dreams for your career? What are your dreams for yourself? And it's crazy, you know, for our team members that are making, you know, 13 to 20 bucks an hour, uh, some of them are just barely, you know, keeping their, their nose about, body. they're not, they're not thinking of, about, uh, their dreams. So when we sit down and take the time to ask them those questions and actually pull their dreams down, write them on paper, write an action plan down, and then help hold them accountable to accomplish some of those things. And we track in our personal development world, we track how many dreams have been accomplished as part of our metrics there, which is pretty cool. Smoking cessations, weight loss, uh, marriage improvements, family improvements, uh, finance improvements, you name it. We, we track a lot of cool things that, again, go back to impact, purpose, significance, um, it, it just, it, and then we all get in on it and help each other through those things. Um, it just creates a different type of company environment and culture that you, you probably wouldn't find anywhere else. And that's our hope that people hear in this message. And, you know, when we talk about it, you know, out in our communities, um, that, that other people kind of, the light bulb goes off and people kind of say, you know, maybe we should, we should look at doing that. So good. So, so good. I hope people who are listening to this hear the power of what you just shared, because we can get so caught up with performance, especially mm -hmm. at the level of size of organization that you have and the amount of uh, team members that you have to steward and the resources that you have to steward and, 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 and all the different things that you have going on. We can get so caught up with performance, quarterly earnings, profit, all of that. And they're constantly asking, how do we increase performance? How do we increase performance? But the greatest question that we need to ask as leaders is who are we helping our people become? How are we helping them become better spouses? How are we helping them become better parents? How are we helping them with their physical health, smoking cessation, all of these things that you talked about? How are we helping them accomplish their dreams right. and tracking that? Talk about a great KPI to track. How many yeah. dreams have we accomplished as a team? Oh my gosh. When you start doing that, Performance and profitability follow if you focus on that. And you Every guys, time. Did, did you guys, have you read The Dream Manager? That's where we got it. I figured that. I'm like, oh, you're just the blueprint of that book. So good. But you actually implemented it. I, there's so many people that pick up that, that, that book and they're like, oh, well, this is great. It's foo foo, -foo. Yeah. it's yeah. fluff. Yeah. No, we did it. For we that. did it. We, had, we actually call it a Dream Achiever program. And and uh, we've had a thousand dream sessions so far over the last two years that we implemented it. So it came right from that book. So good. So good. That just evidence proof that purpose is more than fluff. It's foundational. That people are truly not only the greatest asset that you have as an organization, but they are the greatest opportunity that you have to make an impact in this world through your organization. 
And that when you take things like that, the dream manager, and you actually embrace it, adopt it, put those things in place of how it can make an impact, not only in your people's lives, the impact you've had now as an organization. Yeah. And for all the business leaders out there that are, you know, still scratching their heads, I, you know, what I'd say is like, you know, people's performance at work get largely affected by the issues that they have outside of work. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're complex, you know, human beings are complex. There's a lot of problems, uh, you know, as, as, as the world continues to get more complex, we seem to have more problems and opportunities, but if we can help our team members, you know, at least steer them in the right direction. Sometimes we can solve the problems really easily. You'd be surprised how easy some of the issues are to solve. Sometimes it's just steering them right in the right direction or giving them a resource uh, to fall back on to help them get through those issues. Um, sometimes it's some, something simple as hooking up with a grief care group uh, if, they've, if they're going through loss or something like that. Or, uh, you know, a couple of our personal development coaches are ex-Edward Jones guys that, you know, that, that have really good handle on finance and can walk somebody through and make it make sense uh, where they're having problems. Uh, but until you get intentional about that process, you can't really help. But once you start alleviating those problems for your people, uh, or at least help them to take steps in the right direction so they know which direction to walk, um, to solve the problem, they just get better at work. And then, you know, things at work start getting better. And again, for the, the culture journey, you know, when we talk about improving culture and reducing turnover, because people say, hey, this is my company, I'm staying here, I'm not leaving, and turnover comes down, what we find is safety, efficiency, quality, and innovation all do this every time. Um, and, you know, likewise, on the the, the, the human component side, you know, if you're treating people well at work, they live in a good culture, they're being led well, they're being coached, they're being mentored, they're cared for, they get, they get uh, you know, they get appreciation for the job that they do every day, or at least they're getting appreciated on a regular basis. They go home, you know, feeling better. They go home happier. They probably treat their family members better, and that just rip, has a ripple effect that's positive for our society. And then they also go home, you know, more mentally healthy. I mean, 75% of the illnesses in this country are, are, are chronic illnesses, and chronic illness largely comes from stress and anxiety. And where do you think that is the, where the source is? It's work. You know, people get stressed out and anxious at work because of typically bad leadership, and that sends them home in a bad spot. And it, you know, it can cause physical, you know, ailments down the road. So if we can make families healthier and we can make health better, uh, mental health and physical health through their culture, why wouldn't we all be running toward, you know, culture journeys, you know, all over the place? It just makes sense. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, imagine, if you will, going to work and then coming home a better version of yourself, a less stressed version of yourself, a more equipped person than when you went in that day. And bring right. that home into yep. your family, right? Imagine walking back in as a mother or father or husband or wife, a better version than when you left the house that morning because of the culture journey that you're a part of at work. That's right. It's so rare to find Jason, and that's why I was so captivated why I came across your story, what you guys have achieved, because this truly is what good looks like. This is yep. everything that we read about in books, you know, whether it's The Advantage and Patrick Lencioni or Halftime or Simon Sinek and Start With Why, we can go on and on and on and on. You, you guys have taken all of that and you've said, let's do it. And yep. you did. And it yep. paid off, not just in terms of company growth and rewarding shareholders and performance and all of that, but in who you've helped your people become, the lives you've changed, probably the marriages that you've changed, That's the right. relationships between parents and their kids. Uh, right. It's such a immeasurable impact that you have made. You're changing the direction, the course of people's life through transformation and impact. And I can tell you story after story after story. There's been so many. When we do that dream session with people, there's a good portion of people that that cry during the process because they've never asked their spouse that question. Their spouse has never asked them. They've never asked themselves. So it's powerful. And, you know, you can do all the, you know, continuous improvement you want on a manufacturing line, but to get that done in somebody's life, transform the person that's actually, you know, leading the person and also transform the person's life and ultimately their, their family and the people they're associated with. So, 
uh, it's it's great stuff. And I would tell other you know people that are watching this too that I learned from Bob Chapman at Barry Waymiller. Um, you know his his truly human leadership. Twenty minute um, TED talk was you know trans transformative for me. It, it's what helped make the light bulb go off. Um, but I I would be willing to talk to anybody. Uh, any leader that has influence, whether you're 10, 10 people uh, in your business or 11,000 like us, uh, it, it, it translates through any business. And I'd be happy to talk to anybody that wants to, that wants to know how to take steps because somebody else helped me take steps. I didn't have it all figured out and uh, there's no right or wrong way to do it. I do some things differently than him, uh, but uh, you know, we just gotta take steps. That's what, that's what matters. I love that you have a heart to pay it forward and to share it with others. And, and here's the thing. There's some people that will listen to this today and will say, oh, they did all of this stuff and, and they, they became a $3 billion company with 11,000 people. Well, that's, that's not the reason to do it. That's the outcome. That's the byproduct. Yeah. The reason to do it is because of all the things that you just said, right? The emotional connections that you made, the difference that you made and all that. And Bob poured into your life and you're willing to pay that forward and that's right. others' lives and that's have right. this cumulative impact, regardless of what company that you're a part of. And so because you are laser focused on purpose, on significance, on impact, on making a difference, all of those things, you're focused on that and not what the ROI is. You're focused on that and not, well, hey, if we do these things, here's how that will translate into profitability. No, you're focused on the actual impact on the difference and the byproduct is all the other stuff that shareholders are looking at. That's right. That's right. So good. And we, and we, we, we've proven it over the last eight years. You look at our results. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're announcing our results for next quarter in a couple of weeks. And you know, uh, that would have the impact of COVID. And I, I'd say our culture saved us through COVID. Um, you know, the journey that we've taken over the last eight years. And the cool thing about culture journeys are, is that, you do it forever. It's going to surpass generations of leadership here if there's an intentionality to take take steps. So there's always a next step to take in culture. You just have to have the courage and intentionality to, to take those steps and make sure, you know, your, your leadership team is on board with you uh, to do that. I could put 20 people in front of you today to, to give the same talk and they tell you a lot of the same things um, because they're experiencing them themselves. They, they bought in and they've seen the results. So and the impact. So, um, yeah. Well, and what you just said there about your culture saving you through COVID is such a testimony because culture really is foundational. A lot of, I mean, it, it, it's not a tool in your toolbox. It's not, it, it truly is the foundation your company is built on. And so when you build your foundation, right, upon rock, right, right. when the storm comes, you're able to get past that. And culture is that rock. That's right. Investing in your people, in who they are as people, paying that forward, blessing them, helping them become who they were created to be. That is the foundation of every great organization. And if you're not building it upon that, when a storm like COVID happens, that's right. You don't survive the storm. Crumbles. That's right. Crumbles. Awesome, Jason. I I'm I'm just beaming ear to ear that a company like yours that gets it, not only gets it, that has implemented it, and then is championing it and paying it forward exists. I'm so glad that our paths connect. And as we wrap up here, I want to give you the last word for those that are listening to this, that maybe they're like, you know, this all sounds great, but we have all of these problems. We have all these challenges. We have all these adversities. We got to fix our finances. We got to get things back. And we don't have time. We don't, we, we don't have time for cold, we don't have time to read the dream manager. We don't have time to implement these things or hire coaches or to look, we, we don't have time. What would you say to those, no matter where they're at in their cultural journey on how they can get from where they're at, overcome and get to where you guys are? Man, it's a loaded question. And I've got a hundred thoughts running through my head, but um, you know, culture is all about, you know, caring about your people. Um, so, if you say you don't have time for culture, you're in essence saying that you don't have time to care about your people. So I can say, I'd say, how can you afford not to care about your people? Number one. Uh, number two, you've got, there's resources out there today, like Lipper Components. So, you know, again, we're, we're, we're not this 10 person company that can 
managed that culture transition really easy. I mean, we had to do it in the midst of being 10,000 or 11,000 people uh, and, and initiate change when for years, uh, we had some leadership that wasn't so great, not doing the right things, and we had to turn that trust around. So I argue that that's a lot more difficult than starting when you're smaller. So I, I'd start when you're small. You've got to have courage as a leader. Um, you've got to have people around you that have that, you know, that same mindset and they're willing to jump in. And then all you got to do, um, you know, I'd say try not to have so big a vision. It's great to have the big vision, but know what you're going to do in the next 12 months and just start taking steps. And one step will lead to the next. When you take that step, the next one will be very, very obvious because there's so much you can do in the world of culture. I've talked about some of those things and, and we feel like we're just scratching the surface. So, uh, but there's resources like Lipper that, you know, like I said, I'd be happy to. I've got a VP of culture. I've got leadership coaches. I've farmed those people out to go talk to people to help get the message out. Uh, I've done a lot of those, uh, had a lot of those conversations myself. And part of my mission is I want to, I want businesses to get it. This is a light bulb that's really just starting to, to click um, uh, with some companies. There's thousands of companies that haven't taken, you know, very many steps or very many genuine steps yet. So um, I, I just tell you that there's resources there to help you take those first steps and probably be, you know, we'd be along there with you anytime you need us. We started a leadership academy last year. Um, so we're almost two years in where you know uh customers started our customers started asking us um hey what, what are you guys doing we got people that are leaving our place to come to your place for maybe less money but because of they they hear all the stuff so we're like hey look you know maybe we should just start our own academy and teach people uh what we've learned and we've, we've started to do that we've, we're you know we've got 35 people 35 different businesses that we're working right now and as a supplier how cool is it that part of your competitive advantage is you're helping your customers, you know, uh, take leadership steps and take culture steps to uh, change the way their company is going to impact their people for generations to come. I think that's pretty cool. That's so good. I just to even think that you decided to take what you have come across, what you've implemented, and say, now let's go and actually help our client base, help other businesses by sharing what we have found and ha helping them to have the same experience for their people and for their purpose and what they're doing. Jason, right. thank you so much for sharing such great wisdom, great insight for championing what good looks like, championing leading with purpose, championing a healthy culture and truly investing in your people and helping them become the best that they could possibly be through their work at Lipper Performance. Truly well, great. thanks for your thought leadership, Davin, and thanks for getting this word out. It needs to be heard. So as many times as you can, you know, get it out there, it's, it's, it's worth it. Even if, you know, one or two people come forward and start making changes uh, going forward, it's, it's worthwhile. That's exactly right. It's about impacting the one. That's right. The one, that one can go impact a million. That's right. So, That's right. Thank you so much for all you've done for the impact that you're making. Today, we are here with Jason Lipper, again, CEO of Lipper Components. And I hope that you listen back through this again. There were such nuggets of wisdom that Jason shared of what good looks like. And you'll be able to catch this recording, obviously, at PurposePoint.com and on our YouTube pages. And you can follow Jason on LinkedIn, go to their website, Lipper Components, and you can see the impact that they're making and reach out to him. He meant it. He genuinely right. wants to help people. So if you're like, hey, where do I start? reach out to him say jason i watched you on the finding purpose live cast i need help raise your hand and they are glad to pay it forward we want to help for sure that's right thank you jason and thank you for listening today we will see you next time on the finding purpose live cast live purposely mm -hmm.